Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, good evening from Mumbai. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Bernd Ulrich. Uh, Bernd Ulrich is an old friend. Uh, we met in 1981 when uh, Bernd had come from Germany. Uh, and I remember in that year, uh, Professor Kunz was also at Purdue. And uh, I met him in a seminar by Professor Abenger. Uh, and uh, we have been meeting on and off uh, for the last 40 years. It's a great delight to have him in our seminar. Uh, uh, Bernd spent the time at Michigan State many years. Uh, and then finally, I think for the last 20 years, he is at Purdue. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, many of the speakers in our seminar, they have some connection with Purdue. And uh, it, it is, it is uh, our pleasure that he is speaking today on the favorite topic of many of us about multiplicities, generalized multiplicities, and uh, integral dependence. Uh, especially for the young people in audience, I would like to tell that uh, uh, it is not only a great delight to read his papers, but also the lecture notes that he writes. We not only enjoy the mathematics, but also we want to look at the handwriting. It is, it is uh, unexpected from a German author. That, uh, he has such a beautiful handwriting that you want to read more and more. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, Bernd has been honored by AMS uh, in, in the inaugural list of fellows of AMS for his uh, beautiful work in competitive algebra. Uh, we are all delighted that he is here with us today online. Uh, we have invited him to Mumbai for a program and he has kindly agreed. Let us hope that uh, we will meet very soon. Uh, Today he will, as I said, he will talk on uh, one of the favorite topics of generalized multiplicities and integral dependence. So I invite Bernd uh, to deliver his seminar. This is a one hour seminar. Uh, we, we can have questions in the chat box during the seminar. After the seminar, we can have free discussion. Yeah, over to you, Bernd. Thank you very much, Joga. And yes, it's very nice to be uh, reminded of the good old days when we met in Purdue in uh, 1981. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to believe, but it's 40 years ago. And as Joga said, uh, last year I was supposed to deliver some lectures in Mumbai. And unfortunately, that uh, was not possible because of COVID. On the positive side, though, now we have uh, online seminars like this one and also uh, the one out of one out of MSI uh, and I, I hope and I believe that these are to stay with us because I think they are great service especially, especially uh, for mathematicians in developing countries and it's it's my great honor and pleasure to be part of this um, so Juga um, one question do I keep track of the chat or uh, are you doing that? Uh, Kriti will keep track of the chat. Okay, good, good. Okay, good. So I don't have to do that. Thank you. So I'll talk about, as Drugal said, about generalized multiplicities and integral dependence. Um, and many of you here has worked on that, especially Drugal has worked on that. Um, and I will, today I will talk about um, the uh, univariate case, so generalized multiplicities that come from Hilbert functions in one variable. And then next time I will pass to the multivariable case. So in other words, I talk about mixed multiplicities. And that will also include the lecture next time, some more recent work with Polini, Chung, and Valitashti. So let me start. Um, so, and I want to start by giving or reminding you, and if you haven't seen it, giving you the definition of integral dependence of ideas. Um, one should also talk about models, but in, this, uh, in, this, in these two lectures, I'm focused on the case of ideas. Uh, so R is a Noetherian ring throughout, and uh, we look at the Ries algebra of I, and that is the R sub-algebra of the polynomial ring in one variable T generated by i t. So that's also isomorphic to the direct sum of the powers of i. So this algebra encodes the asymptotic behavior of the powers of the ideal i. Uh, 
And it also comes up uh, as the co homogeneous coordinate ring of blow ups and so on. It arises in many contexts. So if one has a second idea, J, which contains I, then we say that I is that J is integral over I, or equivalently, I is a reduction of J if the extension of Ries rings, the Ries ring of I in the Ries ring of J is an integral extension in the usual sense of rings. So that means that every element of the larger ring satisfies a monic polynomial equation with coefficients in the smaller ring. And in this case, this also means that I that JT, that the elements in JT are integral over the Ries ring of I. And if, if you write this down in terms of equations and use the grading on the Ries ring of J, then you see that this is equivalent to saying that every element in J satisfies a monic equation with coefficients, with coefficients which are in larger and larger powers of the ideal I. And that comes from the grading of the Ries ring of J. And another way to think of this is well, that, we, that this ring extension is integral means that the Ries ring of J is, is finitely generated as a module over the Ries ring of I. Or equivalently, it is generated by homogeneous elements of bounded degree, say degree at most R. And in terms of the powers of the ideal, this means that from R on, the powers of J can be obtained from a fixed power of J multiplied with powers of I. And from this one gets immediately, sorry, from this one gets immediately that J to the N is contained in I to the N minus R, which of course is contained in J to the N minus R for all large N. So in other words, the powers of I and J grow at the same rate. And in fact, also the converse holds true, at least if the ring R is analytically unramified. That's a result of Ries. And so what that means, this equal growth of the powers of I and J in particular, of course, implies that if the ideals are in primary, then they have to have the same multiplicity. And this already points to the connection between integral dependence and multiplicity theory. Now, one of the applications or one of the motivations for studying integral depends of ideals comes from equisingularity theory. And I want to explain this at least briefly uh, to give some motivation and background. So for instance, let F be a germ at zero of a holomorphic function in n plus one variables. And I want to single out the last variable T and think of that as a parameter variable. Now the vanishing locus of this F is a germ at zero of a hypersurface Z in C n plus one. And then we also have T capital T, the T axis, that's zero cos C. And one assumes usually that the T axis is contained in the hypersurface Z and not only contained, it's contained as a singular locus of so the singular locus of Z. Okay. That's the usual setting of equisingularity theory, but not necessarily for hypersurfaces more generally, but I'm just sticking to the case of hypersurfaces now. So here's a picture, a concrete picture. So the surface Z in this case is a, this hypersurface is a surface in free space. And of course we focus around the origin in a neighborhood of the origin and you see the t-axis and indeed the t-axis is the single locus of z. And then we have the projection map from z onto t and then we can look at the fibers of this projection map and those are the z lambdas. And in this case they are plane curves. Okay? In general they would be hypersurfaces. And they all contain the origin. Uh, now one task or one goal in equisingularity theory is to have criteria to determine whether this family is equisingular, which means that the members of the families, the Z lambdas, the fibers, are somehow similar to each other. And that could mean, for instance, that their singularities are of the same type, of the same topological type, or also 
that the family is topologically trivial. And the two issues are actually equivalent, at least for families of plane curve singularities. And in this case, you see that the family is not equisingular because these plane curves, the Z lambdas, they have nodes as singularities at the origin if lambda is not zero, but that node degenerates to a cusp when lambda becomes zero. Okay? And of course, the question is, how can you detect that if you can't draw the picture? And so here is a general uh, criterion, topological triviality of such a family is implied, and this is worked by Tom and Marta, by one of the Whitney conditions, Whitney condition B, which in turn is equivalent to the ideas condition W. It doesn't matter exactly what it is, but what is important to understand, this is a purely analytic condition about the rate of growth of tangent hyperplanes to Z to that hypersurface as the point approaches the origin. And that purely analytic criterion via the analytic criterion for integral dependence can be translated into integral dependence of certain ideas, namely certain Jacobian-like ideas. Uh, and these ideas, they live on the total space of the, of the family on this Z, so the surface, not these fibers, but the total space. In fact, they are uh, in this uh, ring OZ0, so the local ring around the origin of this hypersurface Z. And what the first ideal is, the ideal I, it's the product of the ideal generated by the axis, these are the non-parameter variables, not the T, times the ideal generated by the partial derivatives with respect to the axis, the non-parameter variables, not the T. And notice that if we restrict this idea to the families, to, to, the, to, to the members of the family, to the fibers, then this simply becomes the maximum ideal of the ring times the Jacobian ideal. And there is no reference anymore to the total space of the family. There is no reference anymore to the family. There is only a reference to an individual fiber. So the parameter variable T does not occur here. On the other hand, the idea J, the larger idea, that involves the partial derivative with respect to the parameter variable. And what turns out is that the integral dependence of J over I, uh, which means essentially that the partial derivative with respect to the parameter variable depends on the partial derivatives on the other, of, with respect to the other variables, that this integral dependence is equivalent to Verdi's condition W and therefore to Whitney equisingularity. And this was observed and proved by Tessier in a very seminal work in the 70s, and it was then later also proved by Gaffney in the general case. Now, in fact, one wants to go one step further. One wants to end up with conditions which are fiber-wise conditions, which only depend on the members of the family, not on the total space of the family. Okay? And Tessier calls this principle of specialization of integral dependence. And he proves this principle, again in the 70s, for families of isolated hypersurface singularities, like what we had in the picture. And the condition is, and in fact, it's even an equivalence, but we are mainly interested in this implication. The condition is that if we take this ideal I, restrict to the fibers, again, we simply then get the maximum ideal of the local ring times its Jacobian ideal, that the multiplicity of these ideals is constant across the family. Okay? So that's the condition. It only depends on, the, on individual fibers, not on how they are put together into the family. And if we go back to this uh, particular example, sorry, uh, if we're get, going back to this particular example, one easily computes that this multiplicity is actually four if lambda is not zero and it jumps to five as lambda becomes zero. And that would again confirm that this family is not equisingle. Okay. Um, now, the question is, what is multiplicity? <laughs> now, in the case of isolated hypersurface singularities, this Jacobian-like ideal 
is an M prime ideal and one has the usual Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. And that's what Tessier used. If one has hypersurfaces which are not isolated singularities, then this ideal will not be M prime anymore. One has to devise uh, new uh, notions of multiplicity. And if one doesn't look at hypersurfaces, it gets even worse. The uh, Jacobian ideal is not an ideal anymore because one has to look at Jacobian models instead of the Jacobian ideal. Those carry the relevant information. So in other words, then one has to talk about powers of models, integral dependence of models, and so on. And there has been a lot of work, of course, uh, to generalize the principle of specialization of integral dependence to more general families, and this work is still going on. But of course, one needs to devise new notions of multiplicity, and one needs to figure out how they can be used in criteria for integral dependence. And today I want to talk about some of these criteria, again, based on um, single variable Hilbert functions. Uh, are there any questions so far? So uh, throughout the talk, uh, R will be a Neuthian local ring with maximum ideal M and residue field K. Uh, D is always a dimension of R, and we assume for simplicity that the dimension is positive, and I will always be an ideal, and we assume for simplicity that I is a proper ideal. And then an important player throughout the talk is G, the associated graded ring of I, which is the direct sum of the higher conormal modules of I. And um, this is actually simply the Ries ring tensored with R modulo I. And this is in fact, and that's important, a standard graded R algebra of dimension D the same dimension as the ring R. And standard graded simply means it is a graded R algebra. And as R algebra, is it is generated by its elements of degree one, its homogeneous elements of degree one. Now let's go back to basics and recall the definition of the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. So in some sense, that's the template one wants to generalize. So assume that I is an M primary idea. And then, of course, um, these graded components of G have finite length. They all have finite length. And then <clears throat> we can talk about a Hilbert function. And since G is a standard graded R algebra and all its components have finite length, this Hilbert function eventually becomes a polynomial, a Hilbert polynomial of degree D minus one. And its normalized coefficient in degree d minus one is the usual Hilbert multiplicity or the degree of the algebra G. And that is defined to be the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of the ideal I, okay? And from this definition, one sees immediately that first of all, this limit exists. And second, it is a strictly positive integer. Now, by additivity of length, there is a second characterization of this multiplicity. Namely, it can also be computed not just in terms of the length of the higher conormal modules, but also in terms of the length of R modulo i to the n. And that's important for later, these two different definitions. And <clears throat> from this second definition, one sees immediately that one passes to a larger idea then the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity cannot go down. It can only stay equal or go up. That's also important. And also it follows immediately that if we have a second idea, M primary, I contained in J, so that J is integral over I, then we had seen that the rate of growth of these powers is the same. And therefore from the second definition of the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, it follows immediately that the two ideas have the same Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. I mentioned that already at the beginning. Now, surprisingly, uh, the converse also holds, and that's a seminal theorem by Ries uh, from the early 60s. And the theorem says that uh, implication can be reversed under weak assumption on the ring. The ring has to be equidimensional and universally catenary. 
And by Radcliffe, that's equivalent to saying that the completion of the ring is equidimensional, which means that all the mineral prime ideals have the same dimension. Now, this assumption on the ring is to be expected because if you start with any ring and you pass to the unmixed part of the ring, so you factor out the unmixed part of the zero ideal, uh, then multiplicities don't change. On the other hand, the fact whether or not one, integral, one idea is integral over another, that does change. So one has to impose such a condition. There's no hope to relax this. Uh, but what one would like to relax is the condition on the ideal, namely the condition that these ideals are in primary. And there has been a great deal of work since the 60s um, trying to or towards generalizing this theorem to the non-primary and primary case. And some of this work or some of the impetus also came from Tessier's work in the 70s, which connected, as I said, integral dependence to questions in equisingularity theory. Um, and then, so the, here are some of the, the players, and I try to list them roughly in chronological order. So the first one to start this was Berger, actually in the late 60s. It took a while to somehow, uh, for this theorem to really catch on. Uh, but then starting in the late, late 60s, there has been quite a bit of uh, activity uh, trying to generalize this. And then, of course, there is a whole uh, uh, sequence of results also dealing with the model case. But I'm not going into that. Now, one of these generalizations is due to Ries himself. And let me explain this. And let me first re re um, rewrite the condition in the M primary case that the two multiplicities are the same. Well, that simply means that these two limits are the same. The limits are used in the, the second definition of the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. But then by additivity, this simply means that if you look at the sequence, the length of j to the n modulo i to the n divided by n to the d, that sequence converges to zero. That's obviously equivalent. But since this sequence is a polynomial sequence, it follows, or that's equivalent to saying, that the length of j to the n modulo i to the n is bounded above by a polynomial of degree d minus 1, the dimension of the ring minus 1. And then we showed that this condition, which makes sense in general, not just for in primary ideas, as long as the length of j modulo i is finite, that this condition then also implies integral dependence. So again, R is equidimensional and universally catenary. We have I and J, and the length of J modulo I is finite. Then J is integral over I if and only if the length of J to the N modulo I to the N is bounded above uh, <clears throat> by a polynomial of degree D minus one. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. So there's a clarification by Vivek. He yes. wants to know if this is true for all n. Uh, what is true for all n? Uh, I guess uh, these conditions that I we mean, want to put on the length. The length, no, the length, if it works for the first part, works for all powers, the, the finite length condition, OK? Yeah. And the, yeah, because it's just a matter of the support of the module uh, mm -hmm. chain i. That doesn't change if you replace the, the ideals by powers. And the conclusion, uh, this, the, the conclusion, this, this being bounded by a polynomial of degree uh, at most d minus one, of course, that doesn't matter. You can always uh, change uh, this. You, the first so many terms of the sequence don't matter. I'm just talking about the upper bound. So mm -hmm. yeah. is that, does that clarify this? Okay, uh, there's one more question. No, thanks. Uh, okay, so there's one more question by Professor Miyazaki. Order of n to the d minus one is the Lando symbol? That's yeah, it just answer. means it's just this means answer answer to the question. Yeah, it's it's not apparently it was, it was just a comment apparently. But this means, as I said, the the, the function the sequence is bounded by a polynomial of degree d minus one. That's all it means with a positive, you know positive 
uh, coefficient, leading coefficient. Any other comment? Yeah, I guess it's okay. Thanks. Okay, so now up to the pretty much the late 90s, all these generalizations, they involved some uh, assumption of this type that one had to assume in one way or another that something is still finite, like in Rhesus theorem. Now, the first to really prove a completely general result in abstract Nithian rings for arbitrary ideals were Flenner and Manaresi uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And <clears throat> their theorem is based on another definition of multiplicity, the J multiplicity, which was introduced by Achilles and Manaresi in the early 90s in their study of intersection numbers that appear in the Stuckrad Vogel intersection algorithm and or in the Stuckrad Vogel intersection cycle. And I'm go, I'll go back to this next time. <clears throat> but at this point, I just use it as a, as a tool to say something about integral dependence. And this is a multiplicity that works for arbitrary ideas. <clears throat> unlike the hilbert samuel multiplicity. And the idea is quite simple. Now, what's the problem uh, with the definition of the hilbert samuel multiplicity in general? Now, in general, these graded components of the associated graded ring need not have finite length. Okay, So it doesn't make sense to talk about the Hilbert function, the Hilbert function of G in this case. However, if we pass to the Zeus local cohomology of these R modules, with support in the maximum ideal of R, then the models do have finite length. Uh, remember, in general, the zeroth local cohomology of a module over a local ring with support in the maximum ideal is a set, consists of a set of all elements that are annihilated by some power of the maximum ideal. And if you have a finitely generated module, then its H0 is the unique largest submodule that has finite length. So it makes sense if these models don't have finite length, you just replace them by their H0 and then look at the Hilbert function. And that's exactly what happens. So we replace this zero, this G by its zeroth local cohomology with support in the maximum ideal of R, not of G. M is the maximum ideal of R. And that's a direct sum of the zeroth local cohomologies of these higher conormal models. We have finite length. And the point, of course, is now that G is a standard graded algebra, and this is a finitely generated graded module over a standard graded algebra, and all the components of this module have finite length. And then again, we have a Hilbert function, uh, we have a Hilbert polynomial, we have a normalized leading coefficient in degree D of this polynomial, I shouldn't call it the leading coefficient. It is a the coefficient in degree D of this polynomial. And that polynomial, of course, has degree at most D minus one because D is the dimension of the associate graded ring. Okay. So therefore, D is at most the dimension of this ideal or this module, if you want H zero over G. And since D is at most the dimension, the Hilbert polynomial will have degree at most d minus one. And we say that the j multiplicity of i is that Hilbert multiplicity if the dimension of h0 is maximum possible, namely d, and otherwise it is zero. Okay? So if you define it this way, then this picks out exactly the coefficient of that Hilbert polynomial of degree d minus one. Okay, so that's, that, that second equality works because I have made this case distinction. Okay? Otherwise, you couldn't say uh, what degree, what coefficient the J multiplicity picks out in this Hilbert polynomial. Okay? So we always have this Hilbert polynomial of this module, that's always true. And the degree of this Hilbert polynomial is always at most D minus one. And, but that's the coefficient we take, whether that is zero or not. And from this definition, again, it's clear uh, that the limit exists and that it is a non-negative integer. But of course, it can be zero if the dimension of H0 is not big enough. And when does that happen? Now, 
J, the J multiplicity is non-zero if and only if H zero has maximal dimension, namely D. And that's equivalent, that's easy to say, to saying that G tensored with the residue field of R has maximal dimension, namely D. Of course, nothing could be bigger than D because the dimension of G is D. And this wing G tensored with K uh, plays an important role that's called the special fibering. And what's particularly important is the dimension of this wing. This dimension of G tensored with K is called the analytic spread of I and it's denoted by L of I. And from what I just said, it's clear that the J multiplicity is non-zero if and only if the analytic spread is maximal, namely D, the dimension of the ring. And in fact, one can say more, the support of the J multiplicity of I, that's simply the set of all prime ideals where the J multiplicity of I localized at the prime ideal does not vanish. That support is exactly the set of prime ideals which contain I and where I has maximal possible analytic spread locally. So in other words, the analytic spread of I localized at P is equal to the dimension of the ambient ring, which is now R localized at P. Okay? And we call this set of prime ideals L of I. And that's a critical set of prime ideals. It will appear over and over again in these lectures. Okay? And there's another way to think of these prime ideals, at least when R is equidimensional and universally catenary. This set of prime ideal is simply the set of contractions to R of the minimal prime ideals of G. That's not hard to see. Um, and in particular, of course, this shows that the set L of I is finite. So the set L of I is a finite set of prime ideals that you attach to your ideal. So it's not a closed set or anything like this. It's a finite set. It always contains the minimal primes of the ideal I, there is not much of a relation between L of I and the set of associated primes of I, but that set L of I is equal to all possible associated primes of the integral closure of the powers of I. And the integral closure of an ideal is a set of all elements that are integral over an ideal, or if you want, it is the unique largest ideal that is integral over a given idea. And that last equality is due to Magadan. Okay? So again, this will reappear again and again, this last inequality. Um, okay, and uh, from this, and then there's one more uh, description, more, one more uh, characterization of the analytic spread, which will also be very important for us. If the residue field is infinite, then the analytic spread of I is the smallest number of generators of a reduction of I. So it's the smallest number of elements you need to generate an ideal over which I is integral. So in some sense, L of I measures the complexity of this ideal I. It's also the smallest L so that L general elements of I generate a reduction. And this is an effective way to create reductions in the most efficient way. Reductions that are as small as possible. Again, this will resurface soon again. And from this one sees immediately that the analytic spread is at least the height of the ideal. Well, why? The analytic spread of I is the number of generators of a reduction. And by Cole's altitude theorem, the numbers of generators is at least the height, in this case, of the reduction. But if you pass to a reduction of an idea, the height doesn't change because the two ideals have the same radical. So that's the first inequality. The second inequality, the upper bound, the analytic spread is always bounded by the dimension and also by the number of generators of the ideal. That is clear from the description as the dimension of G tensor with K. Now from this one sees, for instance, that if I is M primary, then the analytic spread is D maximum possible. Or if I has a property that its height is equal to its number of generators, then the analytic spread is the height, smallest possible. Again, this will be used later. Okay, so this was a 
a short uh, excursion to analytic spread, but that's an important invariant throughout the two lectures. Now, let me uh, offer an alternative generalization uh, of the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. And for that, again, we have to uh, re recall the two definitions of Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, one using the length of the higher conormal models, the other using the length of R modulo i to the n. And the first definition led to the definition of the J multiplicity. So we replaced length by length of H0 in the first definition, we got the J multiplicity. Now, the second definition leads to another uh, generalized multiplicity, namely the epsilon multiplicity. So here we just take, we replace in the second definition of Hilbert Samuel multiplicity length by length of H0. We get some sequence of integers, certainly well defined. It has a limit superior, and this, this limit superior is a non negative real number. And that's the epsilon multiplicity of the idea. Um, now, uh, in the case of the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, the two definitions were equivalent because length is additive on short exact sequences. Of course, if I take H0 and then take length, that's no longer additive on short exact sequences because H0 is not an exact functor. So this is only sub additive. So, and in fact, these generalized multiplicities, the J multiplicity, and the epsilon multiplicity are very different animals. So first of all, here one takes limit superior, not limit. And second, the epsilon multiplicity can be irrational. That was shown by Kotkowski, uh, Ha, Srinivasan, and Teodorescu. In particular, that shows that the epsilon multiplicity is not always uh, some kind of a normalized coefficient in a Hilbert polynomial of a finitely generated graded model. Okay? Otherwise, it would have to be rational. So this doesn't hold. Um, on the other hand, um, Kartkowski has shown that's a difficult result, actually, that one can replace the limit superior by a limit if the ring is analytically unratified. Okay? Now, obviously, because of what I said, the epsilon multiplicity is much harder to compute than the J multiplicity. Nevertheless, it has advantages over the J multiplicity. Namely, it's much better behaved in family, in families. It's upper semi-continuous, unlike the J multiplicity. Okay? And therefore, it's more suitable for the use in equisingularity theory. So this really does point to, to one fact. Namely, there is no optimal, no unique optimal generalization of the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. It depends what you're trying to do. And next time I introduce yet another generalization which has other advantages. Um, so going back to the comparison with the J multiplicity, uh, again, by subadditivity, it's clear that the epsilon multiplicity is bounded above by the J multiplicity, and one can also show that their vanishing is equivalent. So again, the support of the epsilon multiplicity is this set L of I. Now, going back to integral dependence, both multiplicities allow for a Ries theorem, a Ries theorem for arbitrary ideals. And so that's a theorem by Frenner and Manaresi that I mentioned before. It was the first result that gives a general multiplicity based criterion for integral dependence of ideas, arbitrary ideas in abstract Euthian rings. So R is again equidimensional and universally catenary, it's local, and we have two ideas I contained in J then J is integral over I if and only if locally everywhere, I and J have the same J multiplicities, okay? And of course, you cannot expect uh, that you get away without localizations because just the J multiplicity of I at the maximum ideal and the J multiplicity of J at the maximum ideal may not mean much because they may be zero, okay? So that one really has to look at uh, localization. On the other hand, it's enough to have the upper bound. The J multiplicity of I should be less or equal to the J multiplicity of J locally everywhere. And of course, that inequality is enough to check 
at those prime ideals where the J multiplicity of I is not zero, because otherwise that's trivial. Zero is less or equal to any non-zero integer. So that in other words, it's enough to restrict yourself to these prime ideals in the set L of I, which is a finite set. So this makes this a finitistic criteria. You don't have to check infinitely many prime ideas. And these prime ideas in L of I, in principle, at least they can be computed because they are contractions of minimal primes of the associate cratering. So certainly on a computer, you can compute them at least if uh, the examples are not too complicated. So that is uh, this equivalence. Uh, I should also point out uh, it's not obvious, in fact, it's false that in general, the inequality of the J multiplicities implies in the equality. That's trivially true for the, for the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, but it doesn't work for the J multiplicity. It can be that if you pass to a larger ideal, the J multiplicity can actually go down strictly. So therefore, there is some content in this inequality. Okay, And the same is true for the epsilon multiplicity. That was, there's the same theorem, replacing J by epsilon that was proved by Katz and Valdashti and by Valdashti and myself in the model case also. Let me also point out that formally from this theorem, it follows immediately that J is integral over I if it is so locally at the finitely many primes P in L of I. So one doesn't have to consider the maximum ideal. It's enough to check that this at these prime ideas P, which in general are not uh, containing the maximum ideal. And this is actually uh, an immediate consequence because in the criterion, one only involves the prime ideals in L of I, okay? But that last fact also follows immediately from this theorem of McAdam that I mentioned before, the associated primes of the integral closure of I in particular appear among the primes in L of I, and that also gives that equivalence because if we have that J localized at P is integral over I localized at P for all P in L of I, then this means of course, by definition, that J localized at P is contained in the integral closure of I localized at P for every P in L of I, but the integral closure of I localized at P is the integral closure localized at P outside. And so now we have, since remember, every associate prime of I bar appears in the set L of I. Now we have that J is contained I bar locally at every associate prime of I bar. And then it follows, of course, that J is already in I bar globally. That's a general fact about containment of ideas, okay? So that's a very easy consequence of McAdams result. Um, now, uh, I want to spend the rest of the lecture today <clears throat> giving a proof of this result. Um, and now, after this uh, result, um, Javid Validashti and myself uh, try to generalize it from ideals to modules again because of applications in equisingularity theory. You really want to prove these things for models, not just for ideals, uh, but the proof uh, from the ideal case doesn't carry over to models. That's, that's true in general. In multiplicity theory, things become very different for models. For once, there is no natural notion of an associate graded ring of a model that's at least the naive definition doesn't go through because the powers of models, unlike the powers of ideals, do not form a decreasing filtration. Or even worse, that's more serious, um, in general, one of, a standard technique in multiplicity is to cut modulo general elements inside the ideal, like superficial elements and so on. So in other words, one intersects with general hyperplanes that contain V of I, and oftentimes the multiplicity stays the same. And that is absolutely not true in the module case. So that technique doesn't work. So one has to do something totally different. And then uh, Javid and I, we did something totally different. And it turns out that that proof was actually more um, natural and easier and gave a much simpler proof in the ideal case. And that's the proof I want to present here. And that proof also 
used some earlier work uh, joined with CMIS and Vasconcelos. So this is the theorem we want to prove, and I want to prove the, the, the important and difficult implication, and that is that if we have the inequality locally everywhere, we can assume locally everywhere, because as I said before, you can replace L of I by V of I. If you have this inequality locally everywhere of the J multiplicities, that should imply that J is integral over I. That's the goal we want to prove. And now let's do some simple reductions. Uh, we may assume that the height of I is positive, simply adjoin a variable to I and to the ring and localize. We may also assume by induction on the dimension of the ring that locally on the punctured spectrum, J is integral over I, that's just induction. We may even assume that locally on the punctured spectrum, J is equal to I. And that can be done simply by replacing I by its integral closure inside J. Since J is integral over I locally on the punctured spectrum, after I pass through the integral closure, it's actually equal to I locally on the punctured spectrum. And of course, the conclusion that the two ideals are integral over each other is ineffected, is not affected by this change. And the assumption that the J multiplicity is the same is also not affected by this change because of the forward direction, the J multiplicity stays the same if one passes to an ideal integral over given ID. So this is a reduction one can do immediately, okay? But since these ideals are now equal on the punctured spectrum, sorry, since they're equal on the punctured spectrum, it follows that the length of J modulo I is finite. So we can assume the length of J modulo I is finite, like in Ries's theorem. And we assume also, that's part of the theorem, that J of I is less or equal to J of J. And from that, we want to deduce that J is integral over I. So that's the theorem that we have to prove, okay? So now let me um, start all over again very generally. Um, what does integral dependence mean? So let's review that. Um, we, we have an equidimension, and this is actually what I say here now is from the, this joint work with Siemens and Vasconcelos. Uh, we have an equidimensional and universally catenary local ring of dimension D, and we have I is contained in J, ideals of positive height. And now what we do is we replace the ring R by this ring R tilde, which is the Ries ring of the larger ideal. And remember, integral dependence really takes place in the Ries ring of the larger ideal. And we replace J by J tilde, which is the ideal in the Ries ring generated by JT. And we replace I by I tilde, which is the ideal of the Ries ring generated by IT. Okay, so we make these changes and then from the definition of integral depends, I gave at the beginning, it's clear that J is integral over I if and only if J tilde is integral over I. But now I'm in a standard graded ring, unlike before. R tilde is standard graded, R is just trivially graded. And because of the standard grading, we have that J tilde is integral over I tilde if and only if the two ideals have the same radical. In general, integral dependence implies the same radical. But the converse holds in this graded setting. And this is because, first of all, R tilde is standard graded, I tilde is an ideal generated by linear forms, and J tilde is the ideal generated by all linear forms in the ring. And then it's obvious that uh, if J tilde, some power of it, say the nth power, is an I tilde, you can write J tilde to the N as I tilde times some idea which is necessarily generated by forms of degree N minus one. And therefore that idea has to be in J tilde to the N minus one. So therefore J tilde to the N is equal to I tilde times J tilde to the N minus one. And therefore J tilde is integral over I tilde. So that's trivial because of the grading. That's where the grading comes in. And that's the same, of course, as to say, that J tilde, this ideal J tilde, 
once I extend it to the ring R tilde modulo I tilde is nilpotent. So it's simply the property of nilpotence of this particular idea. So I haven't done much yet at all yet. Now the goal is to replace this integrality condition by a dimension condition. A dimension condition can be read off hopefully from some kind of a Hilbert polynomial and that then relates to multiplicity theory. Okay, So now how can nilpotency be checked from a dimension condition? Well nilpotency means that the ideal is in each minimal prime of the ring. Okay, is in each minimal prime of the ring. But you cannot capture these minimal primes, all of them, unless they all have the same dimension, unless the ring is equidimensional. And of course, this ring R tilde modulo I tilde is not equidimensional, unless, for instance, if J is integral over I, which is exactly what we want to prove. So it's not equidimensional, but it's easy to embed a ring into an equidimensional ring by passing to the associated credit ring. Okay? So R tilde modulo I tilde is obviously a subring of the associated credit ring script G of I tilde. And associated credit rings tend to be equidimensional if the ring you start with is equidimensional and universally capital. That's a theorem of Radliff. Uh, the way in this case it goes is you have R, equidimensional and universally catenary. J is an ideal of positive height. Therefore, the re-swing R tilde is again equidimensional and universally catenary. And now you do it again. You have this ideal I tilde in R tilde. Its extended trees ring again is still equidimensional and universally catenary. If you pass to the associated grade ring, it is equidimensional and universally catenary. Okay, so that property you get almost for free. And the dimension of G, of course, is the same as the dimension of R tilde. And R tilde, since J has positive height, has dimension D plus one. So one more than the dimension of R. So that, that we have. And remember what we wanted was, we wanted to study when this idea J tilde in the ring R tilde modulo I tilde is nilpotent. But nilpotency doesn't change if you extend this idea to a larger ring, namely G. So now the issue is whether J tilde times G is nilpotent in G. And G, remember, is an equidimensional ring. So now uh, we are in good shape because this, the nilpotency of this idea, which means, of course, that the ideal is an every minimal prime, is certainly implied if this idea vanishes locally at every minimal prime. Because if it vanishes at a minimal prime, it has to be in that minimal prime. Because otherwise, if you localize, it would become the whole ring, and that's not zero. Okay. So this is actually uh, the nilpotency is implied by the vanishing locally along all the minimal primes. In fact, in this case, it's even equivalent. But we, we, this is not of a concern for us now. And now use the fact that this ring is equidimensional of dimension d plus one. So, because then all these minimal primes have dimension d plus one. So this vanishing is equivalent to the vanishing at all the primes whose dimension is exactly d plus one. So the last equivalence is trivial, and it, but it uses the fact that g is equidimensional of dimension d plus one. And if I put it that way, then this is simply a condition on the cold dimension of the module j tilde g. It says that that module does not have maximal dimension d plus one. In other words, that module has dimension at most d. Okay. So in summary, I've now translated a condition of integrality, which I would like to prove, into a condition on a cold dimension. The condition is simply, or the, the sufficient condition, which is even necessary, is actually that the cold dimension of this homogeneous ideal J tilde in G as a G model. So if you want the cold dimension of this G model J tilde G is at most D. That's the only condition, okay? And now, once we state it that way, we have a chance to translate the dimension condition into a vanishing condition for a certain coefficient in the Hilbert polynomial. Of course, now we have to define what kind of multiplicity 
do we mean? What do we want to use? And what we actually define now is a generalization of the J multiplicity. It is a relative version of a J multiplicity. And to do that, uh, one has to think a little bit about the grading of this ring G. Remember, G is the associate graded ring of the ideal I tilde. And of course, G is a graded ring, a associate graded ring. It always comes with a grading, but the usual grading just makes this a standard graded ring over R tilde. That's not what I want. I want a standard graded ring over R. But one can make this a standard graded R algebra if one uses the internal grading of R tilde. Remember, R tilde by itself is a standard graded R algebra, and therefore each of these higher co-normal models, the I tilde to the J modulo I tilde to the J plus one, each of these models is a graded model. So it inherits the grading just from the ring R tilde, and that's the grading I'm giving to G. I'm, I'm ignoring the filtration grading of this associate grading ring and just go back to the internal grading that comes from the ring. Okay, so this was actually from the work with Javid. And we used this grading quite a bit. Uh, and then with this grading, I have a standard graded R algebra. And this ideal I'm interested in, J tilde G is a homogeneous ideal. So we are in pretty good shape. And one can easily write down the graded components. Each graded component is a direct sum of this quotients, uh, of these quotients of powers of I times powers of J. And we just, in each sum end, we trade one factor of J by a factor of I. Okay? And J has to appear at least once in each of the numerators because I'm multiplying G with J tilde. If I wouldn't have done this, there would also be the direct sum with I to the N, okay? But that's what this looks like. Um, so this is now a, a finitely generated graded model over a standard graded algebra. So we're in good shape, except that of course, there's no reason why the length of these graded components should be finite. So we do what we always do. We pass to H0. And if we pass to H0, this will be a homogeneous idea um, in this standard graded R algebra, all of whose components now have finite length over R, over the ground ring. R is the degree zero part, the ground ring, okay? And then we have, of course, a Hilbert polynomial and we have a Hilbert function. I call this Hilbert function lambda. It depends, of course, on i and j. And you can write down what this Hilbert function looks like, just because I've described the graded components. It's simply a direct sum over lengths of zeroth local cohomologies of these factor modules. And by the usual uh, theory of um, Hilbert polynomials, their standard um, commutative algebra one facts, uh, the dimension, of course, remember of G is D plus one, therefore the dimension of this module H zero of J tilde of G is at most G plus one. So the Hilbert polynomial has degree at most D because the dimension is D plus one at most. So the Hilbert polynomial has degree D at most and its normalized coefficient in degree D, that is what I call the relative J multiplicity of I in J. So I've now defined a new multiplicity, a relative J multiplicity associated to two arbitrary ideals, one contain the other. And this J multiplicity by definition again is a non-negative integer. Now it does include the J multiplicity I just defined before. Namely, if J happens to be the ring R, then if you look in the definition of this Hilbert function, I'm looking at sums of lengths of zeros local cohomologies of these higher co-normal models, okay, which I've used in the definition of the J multiplicity before, except now I take the sum over those. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking the sum transform of the function I had looked at before. And the effect of that, of course, is that the degree of the polynomial increases by one, but the coefficient the normalized coefficient in degree D minus one and D respectively is the same. So this is simply the usual J multiplicity. It also sort of makes sense because 
Of course, what I'm doing here, I'm replacing the ideal I in R by the ideal I tilde in R tilde. And if R tilde if the, is the reasoning of J, is J is the unit ideal, then R tilde is simply the polynomial ring in one variable over the original ring. And the ideal I is I times the variable and you take the ideal generated by that in the polynomial, it all sort of makes sense that this doesn't change the multiplicity. So you should expect this. Uh, one other thing though, like uh, the, J, the normal J multiplicity is a generalization of the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, this relative J multiplicity is simply a generalization of the multiplicity that was used in Riese's second theorem I mentioned, namely, which comes from the length function of j to the n modulo i to the n. Because, of course, if the length is finite, then I don't have to take h0, and then uh, by additivity of length, this lambda is simply the length of j to the n modulo i to the n, the function that was used in Ries. And this also shows, of course, that this function is a polynomial function eventually that was proved by Amar in the 70s, that the degree is at most d that was proved by Ries also. And finally, what does it mean that this relative J multiplicity vanishes? Where well, it means, just from the definition, that the degree of the Hilbert polynomial is at most d minus one, which means that the dimension of the module, the Krull dimension of the module is at most d. Okay. And remember that's kind of condition we wanted before. We wanted that the dimension of j tilde g is at most d because that is equivalent to integral depends. Here we have still the h zero. We don't want the h zero, okay? However, if the length of j modulo i is finite, then we don't need the h0 and we get what we want. So this is what I'm now summarizing in the following theorem. Uh, R is again equidimensional and universally catenary, local. We have two ideals, i and j, and the length of j modulo i is finite. Then we get this super additivity of relative j multiplicity j multiplicities. The j multiplicity of i, remember, which is the relative j multiplicity of i in the ring, is at least the j multiplicity of i and j plus the j multiplicity of j. So it's super additivity of relative j multiplicities. Second, if the relative j multiplicity vanishes, so in other words, if the lengths of j modulo n modulo, modulo i to the n grow at most as a polynomial of degree d minus one, then indeed j is integral over i. And that's exactly the second theorem I mentioned before, so I'm proving that along the way. And finally, if j of i is less or equal to j of j, then indeed j is integral over i. And that's of course the theorem of Flenner and Manaresi, because I had already reduced the case where the length of j modulo i is finite. So let me prove this. Um, and this is really just putting things together now. So first of all, to prove B, now because of the finite length condition, a zero of J tilde G is the same as J tilde G. And then we had just seen that the vanishing of the relative J multiplicity implies that the dimension of H zero J tilde G is at most D. Therefore, since they are the same also, uh, j tilde g has dimension at most d. And then in the first part, we, we proved that in general, complete in general, this is equivalent actually even to the equivalent to the integral dependence of j on i. So that follows just putting these two things together that the vanishing of the j multiplicity implies the integral dependence. That's Riese's theorem, just phrased differently. Now, what about part c? That's also clear now, because if we assume that the J multiplicity of J is at least the J multiplicity of I, and we combine that with the lower bound for the J multiplicity of I in part A, then we deduce that the relative J multiplicity is zero, and therefore by part B, we deduce that J is integral over I. So that's the Flenner-Manaresi theorem. It remains to prove 
super additivity, so part A, because of course we used in the proof of C very much with super additivity. And let me just uh, do this quickly. So the claim is that uh, J of I is bounded below by the relative J multiplicity but plus the J multiplicity of J. And so we just uh, write down this inclusion of the relevant players. Um, the factor modules that correspond to these vertical inclusions, they are finite length because the length of J modulo I is finite. And those are the factor modules that give the relative J multiplicity. The other factor modules, the vertical, the more horizontal or diagonal lines, uh, they don't correspond to quotients of finite length. Uh, and they give the J multiplicities of J and of I respectively. But nevertheless, of course, one has the obvious uh, short exact sequences uh, that the first one comes from first taking the, the horizontal, the, the vertical inclusion and then the diagonal inclusion and the second one just doing it the other way around. And notice, of course, that the middle module are the, the middle modules are the same. And then, of course, these models do not have finite length, so we have to apply H0. And H0, of course, is not exact, but we have a long exact sequence of local cohomology. And the module, for instance, on the upper left hand side, J to the n plus 1 modulo I to the n plus 1, has finite length. So, therefore, it is its own H0 and its H1 vanishes. So, therefore, that exact sequence is a short exact sequence. The other exact sequence is only left exact. But now all the modules have finite length and I can use additivity of length to get a, oops, to get a, hmm. this is odd, it doesn't work. Well, there is some, something wrong in my file. Um, this is a little bit unfortunate um, because this is sort of, but uh, you can imagine um, I may have to go back to this next time. Something got stuck. Almost as if it doesn't let me go to the last page. Uh, but you can imagine, I may quickly go back next time. So uh, you can imagine that. Um, oh, so you can also try writing because you're using the iPad. You can yeah. try writing on the. I could write, uh, I could, yes. Uh, do we have time uh, for that? Uh, I guess it, it, it's not long, uh, but do I have enough space on this? <laughs> uh, yeah, please, you can okay. go ahead. Okay, good. Um, so I got this. How do I do the writing? Ah, yeah, good. Good. So, um, so let's look at this sequence here. And from this, we get uh, that the, the length of this term here maybe I should have put it down so I can write better. Um, that this length, length here is greater or equal to, well, what do I have? It's greater or equal to this sum here is greater or equal to that sum, okay? And then I, I mean, this sum here, these two terms, I just maybe underline, this sum is greater or equal to this sum here because these are equal, okay? And then we get this greater or equal to the length of j to the n, no, I'm just solving, modulo i to the n plus one. I still have this term here, this term here, which I have to bring from the other side, so I subtract. 
and I want to put this together. And then I still have to add this term up here. Let's do length. Okay. And now I want to look at um, this term, these three terms in parentheses, and this. And all these are eventually given by polynomials of degree at most d minus one, because these outer terms, they are the length functions that give the j multiplicity, okay, the usual j multiplicity. Now, what about this here? This is the difference function, this middle guy here. This is the different function, difference function that gives the relative j multiplicity. Now, the function that gives the relative j multiplicity is a polynomial of degree at most d. If I take the difference function, I get at most degree d minus one. So now I have polynomials of degree at most d minus one, and I'm comparing the normalized coefficients in degree d minus one. If I do that, then on the left hand side, I get the j multiplicity of i. And over here, I get the j multiplicity of j. And if I do this difference function, I don't change the normalized coefficient in that degree d respectively, d minus one. And that was the relative multiplicity. By definition, okay. And so this is the inequality that I was after. And that is the proof of part A. And now I can't even go back anymore. Something is completely stuck. And since I've proved part A and A was what was missing, I've proved the whole theorem. And this in particular proves uh, Flenner Manaresi and also proves Ries's second theorem. And of course, it includes also Ries's first theorem. Uh, so next time uh, I will talk more about mixed multiplicities. And now why, why do we want to go on with more multiplicities? Well, the reason is this theorem is very nice, but it requires localization. So it would be nice to have a statement which does not refer to any localization, uh, also knowing maybe prime ideals in the set L of I and such issues, and rather have uh, globally defined multiplicities which detect uh, integral depends of arbitrary ideas. So I'm talk going to talk about this next time. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? You can open your mic and ask any questions you ha if you have. <clears throat> Professor, um, is there a uh, equivalent theorem for epsilon multiplicity also? Pardon, what? Is there an equivalent theorem for uh, epsilon multiplicity? Uh, yes, yes, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yes. is it kind of, the, the proof is uh, kind for of instance, similar? For instance, one can, one can, this same proof carries over to the epsilon multiplicity. And the epsilon multiplicity is even easier, you know, so this is... Um, Right, that's a good point. Uh, the same proof also would, for instance, prove the 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 Kratzwald-Dashke theorem. Um, and but it's even easier in that case. So things same. Another free question I have is: instead of using normal powers, if you use Frobenius powers, do you get anything? I mean, it's an it's an out of the way question. Yeah, well, I've never thought about this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Bernd, I, I have a question about uh, minimal multiplicity in the usual Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. We have notion of minimal multiplicity. Right, right. Do we have such notions for J? Yes, and we, do, we, 
Yes, we do have notions uh, for J also. And, you know, this was then also used to, to prove some of the, you know, uh, Sally type results, you know, minimum multiplicity implies so the created ring is called McCall and almost minimal, you know, almost common, things like that along these lines. Some of these were proved by uh, Polini and Yu Shi and also Jonathan Montano. He has some result along these lines. So there are results, you know. So, you know, the first results uh, proved by Sally, you know, Rossi, Vala and so on. So the, the sort of the first level of results uh, along those lines, they were generalized to the chain multiplicity. You know? But oh. I, there's still, I think, there's still things to do, you know, in that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Today I didn't give any open problems, but next time I will also mention, yeah. uh, mention some the, open, uh, open problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So the J function uh, does make sense. The J function makes perfect sense. Yes. Right. It's, so it's, it's a polynomial. Other other coefficients and in right, 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 right. There are other coefficients have been used, you know, especially uh, the first J coefficient, you know, the equivalent the J one, which is equivalent of E one. Uh, for instance, they have been used uh, to uh, bound uh, complexity of computing integral closures. You know, how many steps do you need to go from the integral from the restring to its integral closure? This this kind of thing has been investigated using the J1, J1 yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, you know, this, some of this has also been done for modules using the book spam rim multiplicity. And of course, mm -hmm. there's also the J multiplicity for modules, which generalizes the book spam rim multiplicity and so on. So some of this work, yeah, carries over. But also that is still, you know, one can do more. One can do more, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, computing the J multiplicity seems difficult. Uh, no, 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 it's not. No, no, it's not. Uh, because it's just, it's a hilbert samuel multiplicity. You know, it's a, it's a multiplicity, it's a degree of a module, you know. And, you know, any computer algebra system does it. The, the epsilon multiplicity is the problem, you know. that's okay. It's a little bit like the hilbert kunz multiplicity, you know. It's something that is a, is a good tool theoretically, but then if I give you an ideal, even a simple ideal, you know, you may be not able to compute what it is. So that's, that's it. because, you know, it's, this is, that is not uh, accessible by the usual theory of Hilbert functions or Hilbert multiplicity because it is not uh, the leading coefficient of a polynomial, you know, so it just doesn't right. work. You never know when you can stop computing because it's not finitistic, you know, so that's yeah. the problem. And there's no epsilon function also. It is just There's an epsilon function, but it is a mess, you know, it, it's, uh -huh. not, it's not a polynomial function, you know. So. Right, 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 right. That's the problem. The epsilon might be is a real problem to compute, yes. Mm -hmm. And again, Javit did a lot of computations for, you know, defining ideas of monomial curves and so on. And th this gets very chaotic and very, very uh, difficult, you know, and it's not, mm -hmm. not at all, you know. So even that is interesting, you know, computing the epsilon multiplicity for examples, you know, I mean, classes of, of examples. This is very, actually very, very interesting because the epsilon multiplicity really has applications in equisingularity theory. Uh, I mean, for instance, um, Steve Kleiman, Javid Valdash, and I reproved the principle of specialization of integral dependence for arbitrary, for families of arbitrary isolated singularities. So, and that uses the epsilon multiplicity of models, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it would be obviously easy, important to, to, to know what the epsilon multiplicity is of models or even of ideals, you know, so. Yeah. Or even classes of ideals. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I ask? Yes. Uh, Bern, very nice proof. Uh, I imagine that the same proof works for filtrations. 
filtrations. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, oh, right. right, right. No, you're right. Yeah, 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 right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another question is uh, in the usual uh, il, mm, multiplicity, uh, Hilbert coefficients, a very good tool is the reduction modulo superficial elements. Right, right. That, is that something mm -hmm. for the J multiplicity or? I talk about this next time. This goes over essentially word by word in some sense. Ah. You know, this works very well for the J multiplicity. Uh, as I said, it doesn't work for modules. It completely breaks down for modules, but for ideals, even for the J multiplicity, it works quite well. Nice. Actually for all the other, also that's what I talk about next time. Also about this other, uh, this third sort of alternative to the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, which is the multiplicity sequence introduced by uh, Achilles and Manaresi. Also, uh, it's a it's a really a sequence of mixed multiplicities, and uh, they also behave very nicely with respect to hyperplane sections or hypersurface sections that contain V of I. And of course, this is all, they behave so nicely that corresponds to the fact that they're very closely related to intersection theory. So that's yeah. something I want to talk about. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Bern. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I guess we don't have any questions. Uh, we will meet next week at the same time. And thank you very much again. Uh, we will have time for more questions. Uh, today, I guess we have to stop here. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.